Good evening. My name is Monty Martin, and welcome to the Monsters of Drakenheim launch live stream. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin, and we are so excited to be celebrating with you day one of Monsters of Drakenheim. And of course, we are joined, as always, by our incredible friends. Jill Denitis and... And Joe Gorman. <laughs> or Pluto Jackson. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, buddy. All so right. excited for you guys. Thank you. Thank so, you for this. And, and congratulations on a very successful day one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, for the, for those that don't know, we are we are just over twelve hours since the Kickstarter went live at eight a.m. Uh, Eastern time this morning, uh, and at twelve hours in, uh, we have surpassed uh, where both uh, Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim and Dungeons of Drakenheim were after twenty four hours. Their first yeah. first twenty four hours. So uh, both uh, we're 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 so the, this is our biggest launch day ever for all three of our projects and we we are so thrilled and so happy and so thankful to all of you for all of your incredible support uh whether you are joining us as a backer whether you are still on the fence just trying to decide if this is the right project for you what you want to pledge for whether you joined our vip discord program and uh we're in the vip lounge and ready to go rated a 8 a.m to uh be one of the first backers from from myself, Kelly, Jill, and Joe, and everyone at Ghost Fire Gaming, a massive and huge thank you for making our first 12 hours such a massive success. Thank you. Also, right away, thank you. Uh, is it Dion for uh, your your super chat? Thanks for that. Um, we are we are so thrilled by Mon for Monsters of Drakenheim. Uh, we've already unlocked what seven stretch goals, eight, six. Uh, let me just confirm uh, how many stretch goals. A pretty, pretty, pretty fair chunk. We're coming up on. Uh, we're coming up on uh, putting Vlad in the book. That's that. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've unlocked eight stretch goals. The ninth stretch goal, which is Vladimir von Draken, I am really excited about. Monty and I worked really hard, and uh, I get to create, help create a monster that uh, is probably going to murder us someday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh yeah, wow look yeah. at that this is gonna be a big thing and of course a big thank you to kyle who is joining us in 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 the chat yeah. as, as, as yeah. well uh um and, and from from all of us at the team there, there's so so many amazing people that have been contributing to this project from all of our amazing artists and product designers at ghost fire games to our cast and crew our partners and many many more um there are there are so many people that pour their heart, hearts and souls into bringing these books to life. It is very much not just, it, it is not me and Kelly that are drawing all these beautiful uh, pieces of art and uh, putting and designing all these fancy delirium dice uh, and packing every book into the boxes. Uh, it is a, a massive team effort. And of course, speaking of that team effort and packing on, on all those boxes, a big thank you to everyone who uh, was a backer on our previous projects, especially Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim, which I am uh, just hearing um, landed at port in LA last week and has now been unpacked. And all of our US backers are starting to get their delivery date. So they're they're tracking information uh, today. Uh, we are hearing from many people who their tracking information has been updated. They have their delivery date. If you're in the U.S. and haven't got it yet, it sh it should be should be getting it any day. Like you should be getting your updated delivery date any day now, and should be receiving it very shortly. Uh, many of our oceanic backers have already received their 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 stuff from the previous project, and the the boats to the U.K., the EU, and Canada are on their way and we actually have had a bunch of people in our some amazing folks in our in our discord server uh doing live updates and live tracking on on the boats as they as they wait to arrive so the uh it, it's it's pretty safe to say that sebastian crow's giant draconum is almost in the can the the last thing for that is the the vtt which is also just being finished up we just got to make sure the character mancer so you can build apothecaries in the vtt is going to be all done so it's really cool to um with all these things, uh, timing and uh, is uh, is always <laughs> a critical thing. But it's cool to know that uh, the last project is 
now out the door and on its way uh, to the door of everyone as we start on the, the next chapter of this awesome project. And what an awesome thing it is, because speaking of VTTs and other digital support, uh, we have some bragging rights uh, for this this project. Ooh, <laughs> we yeah. are the first ever in the history of the world. I just wanted to say as many words as I could to hype that up. To have uh, D and D Beyond integration during a Kickstarter for a Kickstarter, Woo! so uh, we worked it out with D and D Beyond that one of the VTT options available during this Kickstarter is going to be the book, which is going straight to D and D Beyond as soon as it's ready. Uh, so that's really exciting, yeah. and I, we're the first in the world to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So first anyway. Ever. Yeah, anyone who backs the project uh, will be able to select uh, from uh, D&D Beyond, Foundry, or Roll20 um, if you get the VTT bundle. Uh, you can get two, so there are there are a few people that have wanted to know if they can get D&D Beyond plus Foundry or plus Roll20, and you just have to add on an extra VTT if you want to do that uh, to, to your pledge. Um, and so uh, it, it is possible to get both, just the, the, the packages don't give you the option of, of, of one. Uh, for the, a few people are wondering about other VTTs like Shard um, or Alchemy or uh, things like Demiplane and uh, other platforms. Uh, the, the short answer to, to all these is that we, Kelly and I and everyone at Ghostfire Games, we want you to be able to pl experience Drakenheim on the platform that you want. And so we are very seriously looking into as many other platforms as, as we can. Um, with every platform, there is a bunch of labor associated with getting that platform ready to go and getting the localization, like not the localization, the integration built and created. And so it is a, it is sort of a matter of working with both the platforms and, and evaluating um, how their marketplaces work and how many users there are. and developing those things so over time we would like drakenheim to be everywhere um but uh for now D, &D beyond foundry and roll 20 are our first ports of call uh for for this project but uh it, it really is something that i that uh, especially uh, um some of the other uh, really cool vcts that we're seeing coming up as those platforms are building and growing and getting more support uh, we've been talking to a lot of those teams about what it would look like to bring drakenheim to those platforms so it, it is being discussed, but it isn't on the cards for this project this time. Um, I I want to I want to start uh, opening up some discussions. First of all, there's a few people in chat that I want to shout out. Uh, Colton, uh, Jill, you're changing lives. Uh, thank you for the super chat there, and um, also the town drunk, which is always a fun name that I see pop up. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, for the uh, the super chat. I also want to share um, a salt tank has been the one posting about the shipping updates uh, in, oh, in our Discord. Yes. So big thank oh, you to a salt tank for, for for being the one to to post all of that up. Uh, Joe, I want to throw a question your way. Um, how does it feel to have? Okay, okay. Monty asked the same, or like kind of told the same thing to me when we were making book two, but now you are the next one out of us to join the ranks of actually a very small number of people in the whole world to have your D, &D character on the cover and title of an uh, an official D, &D well not official D &D, well it will be on D, &D beyond but uh, 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 of a published D, D book so of a of a published D, D book that is widely released how does it feel to have your character be the hero in in a book like this uh, thank you, Kelly. That's a great question. Um, short and simply, it's about time. Uh, it's about time that I've been recognized for my greatness. Uh, every achievement that I've made, um, you know how many trolls I've killed. I've said it at once. I've said it again. It's a lot. It's bridgeful. <laughs> it's, I'm happy. I'm so excited. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. <laughs> did um, did no, you think... I, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Did, did I think through the whole season one through four no I, not not once it was all in the moment didn't think once acted on impulse almost exclusively <laughs> impulse yeah. sugar coffee maybe some uh, ravioli in there probably 
Uh, uh, but did, did you ever imagine like, like, no. And, and I think like most, um, most of these things, this, you know, Pluto Jackson beyond the name, uh, was entirely like a group effort. Um, I think with any sort of collaborative storytelling, especially, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but more importantly, like on a live stream that we share with all these wonderful people, you, you don't, you sort of like release it into the wild. Um, and you just have to kind of watch it grow. And so this is, you know, not what I originally had a concept for, but I'm more than beyond excited mm. for what it is, but it, to say it was like my character is maybe purely from uh uh uh, uh like i made the D beyond <laughs> character sheet <laughs> beyond that like pluto jackson is all of these moments that i shared with the three of you on stream uh so as much as it's it's exciting to see this character battling monsters it's like i i definitely feel the uh feel the group effort like i think we all get mm. to share in the wonderful uh the wonderfulness that is Pluto Jackson and his uh and his grandioseness, his cockiness, all of it. I, I will say though, Joe, it I, I agree that like all of our characters and Monty's story and everything is is in part like the characters aren't funny in a vacuum. They they exist together and Pluto Jackson is of- a serious <laughs> character. <laughs> I know. What are I you know. talking about? It's oh, me yeah, that yes. it, it, it's yes. entirely me that makes him funny. Um, yeah, I, I'm yeah. aware of He's that. The... Um, but I, I also, okay, there's a lot of people, this happens every time, and I actually want to address this because now I want to talk about Jill. Every time that we start talking about how cool <laughs> it is that Joe is on the cover of a book, our audience explodes with, what about Jill? And, and Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sick of saying this because we're not ready to talk about it, but yes, there's going to be a fourth well, book. Don't worry. Let, let's finish the third one before that's, we... That's we, what I'm we, saying. We, it's we, like, we go everybody that, chill. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Jill's, Jill's not... But I just want to say Jill's not left out of the picture. Don't worry. We, we are thinking of her. She's important. And yeah. we love her. Um, but we're here to talk I, uh, about... Yeah. We're here to talk about yeah, Pluto's I was going to say... Appreciate the love for Veil, but it's it's the love for Pluto right now. Pluto yeah. Jackson's. Yeah, can we focus for a second, guy. chat? Can <laughs> that, we focus that, for a second? It. Give me one day in the spotlight. Yeah. For freak's sakes. <laughs> already going on. Already I love moving it. On. It's like yeah. it's like Joe. Joe, how how do you feel? And the chat's just like, what about what about Veo? We want yeah, that. Like, and we're, we're here. That, Let's that, do it. That, that said, I will address one thing in the chat. A lot of people are suggesting Veo's cookbook. Okay. And I'm just gonna say that. Callie and I cannot write that book because even though I, my my father actually was a Michelin star chef, um, but I cannot and uh, I but I unless unless you want my dad to write uh, to write it, the, I don't the, I don't want your da- so no I don't want my dad I don't want I don't want my dad no, involved no. in any of my business um, collaborate <laughs> yeah but um, <laughs> multi generational collaboration <laughs> but uh, but all, all of that to say that. Uh, um the well there will probably be some kind of nod to uh Veo's culinary experiences uh I expect that one to be full of dungeons and dragons and fi- and and compatible content that you can use in your tabletop role playing games uh not necessarily yeah. things that are for the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> remember yeah. food is very important to veo but she survived in drakenheim for so long so uh there's so much more to everything with drakenheim that we still have to explore so um yeah, I'm excited to uh, see and and be able to get our hands on all these monsters. I know we've been, you know, streaming the stream earlier. Uh, we got to see some of those amazing monsters, but I'm excited to see what else is going to be coming down with them. So here's here's an opportunity. I think that since we're doing this celebration, I'm okay with sneak peeks and mild spoilers. Obviously, we won't give details, but uh, we've filmed most of the episodes for Pluto Jackson's Monster Hunt. What monster? was your favorite or maybe least favorite in terms of we almost got our butts kicked but like what one were you like wow that was a wild monster which one stands out to you guys uh very simply um the apothecaries um Mm. there was a certain uh 
Oh yeah, is the one, the one over Jill's shoulder right now. The, the one, one that the, the one that the, Rudy's fighting. That is the the gnarliest thing I've. And I think Monty was very happy with the way it turned out. And I think we all really enjoyed that uh, that monster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> I was gonna call though. <laughs> what's his What's his name? Can we give the Ripper? The Ripper. The Ripper. The Ripper. Yeah. How much damage? Well, we'll see. I won't give any spoilers away, but yeah. it's a lot of damage. It was 180, 180 damage in a single round. In one turn. Single, in a single turn. 180 turn. single target damage. Single target damage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, yeah. In, in a single turn. Um, uh, Jill, Jill, do you have a different answer? I mean, that one definitely um, was top, but um, the one we fought in the space between worlds right at the end i oh that was that one was tough oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, um that we, don't have, fight. we don't have we, we actually haven't shot the last segment with the uh with with these two yet with uh yeah with our friend uh, <laughs> eating the man i think a man yes. is being eaten behind you there we go the bojack and the chimera the cacophonous chimera, chimera who's eating a dude yeah uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah, That's a great uh, name, Cacophonous Chimera. I the Bojack. Amazing. That's yeah. so good. The Bojack was so funny because, okay, obviously there was a joke. And, uh, you know, okay, there's a Simpsons episode, the the B sharps, and they all laugh. But then the longer you say it, the less funny. Like, it, that, that was the whole point is they first are like, let's call ourselves the B sharps. And they all laugh. And then the more you say it, the, the more you're like, oh, that's actually a good name. When we made the horse monster and Monty went, what if we named it the Bojack? And then we started laughing. And then I was like, actually, if you remove all context, for some reason, that sounds really creepy to me. The Bojack just mm -hmm. sounds scary mm -hmm. so once you yeah. remove the context it's actually a scary yeah. name for a horse spider monster uh it just happens to be a nod to uh bojack horseman yeah. in case you <laughs> didn't know that. yeah uh, uh we got so many super chats happening yeah. thank you thank you there's everyone. a lot of them. yeah there's a lot uh zoro gundam wants to know any chance of a slipcase for all three books uh makes cool stretch goal we're gonna wait for for book four for a slipcase going to be yeah. book four book four, four will, will be a slipcase um and um let's see here uh i want to get to their their full username relax fanty Re Re review says regular casters represent something unknown in our world but not that scary in D, &D. apothecaries represent something twisted and unknown even to regular adventurers of D, D. truly incredible mm -hmm. oh thank you thank you um we're very proud of the apothecary and we we definitely want to develop them uh, a, a lot further um we uh these won't be in this project but uh i think we have about six more subclasses for the apothecary in the works we're standing so, at four but there's two kind of kind of let's see if we can get them off the ground uh yeah. but the ones that are definitely um so the one my, my favorite is the botanist which is the yes. which is the poison ivy inspired Ooh. um uh, apothecary so and and uh we we have that one and i'm working on one called the electromagnetist which i think is kind of fun it's very yeah well we need we need i felt like we needed something with thunder and lightning damage i thought it was yeah like like the the tesla coil style scientist of classic sci-fi fan like yeah yeah, yeah science exactly fiction fantasy. exactly and then i think we've talked about the zoologist which, it, which yes. would be more of a summoner apothecary uh, yeah, the really, zoologist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there's also maybe an idea floating around. This one may not make it in, but there's like a point form note somewhere for a demonologist. Yeah. Um, mm. and I don't know if we have other ones, but that and we may end up with twelve apothecary subclasses. Yeah. Um, by the time we're done, but that's not in this book. Yeah, this that, is just, it's Monty just like, But there is, but I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of fun things for players to fight in <laughs> in in this book in, in, including the apothecary abominations which is what happens yeah. when apothecaries throw morality to the wind and uh the, the, that chapter was really creepy um yeah all yeah. the monsters yeah yeah and w one of the things that we did try to do was we tried to do a monster that kind of represented something that would have been created by different apothecaries so uh jill up up behind your head there is the the brain the disembodied psyche which is our like alienist apothecary <laughs> creation 
Um, and then the the chemistral is the chemist apothecary. Uh, the Ripper and the Reautomata are very much the the uh, the reanimator. And the Injector is a bit of a reanimator, but could be a pathogenist creation as well. Yeah. Um, and then great. yeah, and then we have a few others uh, that we we do have. They they haven't gotten miniatures, but we do have like a demonic vessel. Uh, that is yeah, like which is the exorcist for, for, for the exorcist. And the exorcist then, reverse exercises. Yes, basically. yes, the re- yeah. <laughs> um, and then the what did we have for? Oh, am I forgetting it? The chem- No, never mind. We have the no, chemist. No, we have which, the chemist. Which one are we missing? The mutagenist. Oh, the mutagenist. Yes. Oh, the apex. Yes. The apex. The apex. Yes. So Kelly and I got super inspired by Bioshock. Uh, when, um, we were, when we were working on the Apothecary Monsters. And so the Apex is uh, inspired by Fontaine uh, from Bioshock. Um, yeah. And and is, is very much like, what if you just put all the DNA from everything into one creature? And it worked. Um, and then we also have the, the Wretched Patient, which is, what if you did that and it didn't? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So so those are some of the uh apothecary yeah. abominations. I think the Apex is the apothecary epic boss. It's it's uh, well, we might also tuck Everett Freed in there right. as well. Right. And Everett Freed ascended as well as 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 another apothecary epic boss. Yeah. Um mm. Joe, your beard. Uh chat wants to know how do you keep it <laughs> so perfect? Um uh, it's a heavy regime of um, ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> let it grow. Let it yeah. grow. Um, can I actually ask? Okay, so people have been asking what uh, about the Bruce plushie? Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the Bruce Blue, very Bruce plushie dice bag. Yeah. So, uh, do what do we know about the Bruce plushie, and how can people get it? Because I see it's part of the ultimate set. Yes, it it's, is. It is. It, will it be an add-on? Uh, I believe it will be available as an add-on. I, th- I think it says it is. If you want to yeah. see it, um, we did. We were on the Eldritch Lorecast last week with Ben, uh, with Ben Byrne and um, James Hake, uh, and Ben actually uh, because Ben is in the Ghostfire office in Melbourne, so he had the prototype to hold Ooh. up. So hopefully, we'll have some actual photos of the prototype uh, bag so that you can see actually how big how big it is. But you're you should get a fair chunk of dice in there. Obviously, it's, like, yeah. uh, uh, it's uh, also an extra dimensional space. So yeah, obviously yeah. your your typical dice goblin will need to be discerning about how many dice you get in there. If you have a dice collection like me, that is exhaustive. Over, uh, yeah, that is overflowing <laughs> in boxes. I, but but you know, a, a dice bag that can fit all my dice uh, is not going to fit into. Y- euclidean geometry it's a, it's a garbage bag <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. it's just a it's just a yeah. garbage bag <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah if, if anyone wondering how big the bruise of holding is check out that video with uh, our interview with the eldritch lore cast from last week and you'll you'll see it's towards the end of the broadcast uh that 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 has the examples of it yeah <laughs> other than uh, uh... Other than Bruce, do you guys have any favorite add-ons or accessories for the Kickstarter so far? I mean, for me, it's the minis, 100%. For, okay, I'm a sucker for our special edition covers that are in the top yeah. tier pledge. I think all Ooh. of them have been so beautiful. And the Pluto Jackson cover uh, with his tentacle scarf that we now need to figure <laughs> out how he's going to yeah, get. Yeah. <laughs> it, it actually was great. We got the artwork for that. And Monty and I were immediately like, well, we need to make a monster like parts magic item that you have to collect a bunch of tentacles and make like a tentacle scarf. And uh, Pluto, you're probably going to have to find that at some point. So oh, you know, it'd be so cool artwork. if it like, if like as part of a reaction, the tentacle could like slap away attacks, like it could parry for you. <laughs> it's like a, when like, you know, like when you're eating like a, when you see like a squid and it's like, it's just like alive and you're like, oh. <laughs> Wait, you Does eat live your squid? AC at that point? <laughs> I watch a lot of, uh, a lot of YouTube rabbit holes. Uh, uh, Nico Quaz, uh, thank you so much for the super wow, chat. Wow, yeah. Um, I've been watching y'all from the beginning. As terrifying as your campaign has been, it's the beginning of 
Um, it's the beginning of Albrook University and Everett Freed that I have nightmares about. Looking forward to yeah. many years of content from y'all. The Everett Freed arc, uh, I gotta say, Monty, was yeah. uh, some of the most masterful storytelling yeah. that I have uh, ever witnessed on any medium. I, and I'm was, really biased, but yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah. 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 Scary. Uh, Kevin Kisick, the map pack will be as big as the number of layers we put in the book, and there's. 10 layers at least we so might the, end up with more but yeah. yeah so the 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 and the maps i believe are um because okay so this is an interesting thing when i'm designing maps now i make my maps 24 by 24 or 24 by 36 because that is that fits onto four or six dwarven forged terrain trays which make for an, a very good camera shot for the actual play. So most of the maps that I make are that size. And what's good about that sizing is that it fits nicely onto a full page of your standard, your standard 11, like eight and a half by 11 hardcover RPG books. Nice. So um, the maps will kind of conform to that so that they scale uh, appropriately. Awesome. Um, Matt Oliver also wants to know the, you know, the logistical er issues working with the uh, publisher in Australia. For us, the biggest issue is uh, the 12 hour time difference. So, for meetings. Yeah, for meetings. Meetings yeah. are hard. That, we are always, I'm always ready for bed. And they're right? always just getting up. So like they, they have their morning coffee, and I'm sitting there like, oh man, I just, so like that's yeah. the hardest part of it all. Yeah. I'm yeah. always like winding down for the day and I'm like, right, I have a meeting at 9 p.m. tonight or 10 p.m. tonight. Like it's, mm -hmm. but yeah. it is what it is, but they are incredible. They are so incredible and we couldn't be happier to be working with them. First of all, they're just the nicest people uh, that we've ever worked with. A plus and, humans. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do, a, they do great work. They have an excellent team. Like, I mean, we're on book three. Y'all have seen the artwork. Y'all have seen the layouts. Um, the people that we have on the team it's just it's just astounding um yeah. i love everything about it yeah. so um sir lamafiend wants to know um since we're getting close to 450k can we discuss more about vladimir von draken um uh yes we can so who is vladimir von draken if you don't know uh vladimir von draken is the original um uh founder of the kingdom of westmar um, Vladimir von Draken had a, uh, a, a legend, he was a legendary sword, swordsman who bathed in the blood of his enemies and used his mageborn siblings and the dragons bound to his service to lead a conquering empire. Uh, um, and many, many believe that Vladimir von Draken may have conquered the entire continent had he not been betrayed by his daughter and slain by her and a group of plucky adventurers. Um, history does not remember the full extent of the atrocities that Vladimir um, von Draken committed. Make no mistake, he was not a good man. <laughs> um, and Vladimir von Draken is very much dead. But that which is dead, like that which is buried, need not necessarily be dead. And so Vladimir von Draken and the Court of the Night. Uh, and their vampires presented in this book represent a high level threat that you can use to go beyond the walls of Drakenheim if you've completed the Dungeons of Drakenheim campaign and want to explore the theme of unending conflict that underscores the world of Drakenheim. And so what we include in the lore of the, the Court of the Night is kind of how the Court of the Night might manipulate the story and challenge whatever outcome your players in the Drakenheim campaign uh, had and represent a, a, an insidious threat that threatens to undo whatever political state your players uh, ended up with. And so um, the, the kind of my intent behind that is, is, is showing that like the choice of who rules has consequences and and so if a weak ruler is placed on the throne of drakenheim if someone who 
someone can't meet this threat, right? Then it can be an interesting spin. Um, and so it's a, it, it's a kind of a fun arc, a kind of fun, uh, and and it might be something um, that we we put as as a, an adventure that we explore in more full detail later. But uh, I think Kelly, you can speak to the the stats of Vladimir von Draken. So first and foremost, to some of you are like, oh, is this Drakenheim Strahd? Um, I think that Vlad could eat Strahd for breakfast. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Vlad, yeah. Vlad Vlad would. Yeah, Strad von Zarevich and uh, un unfortunately would not stand a chance in a one on one the, against Vladimir von Draken. The <laughs> only time that Strad Strad might stand a chance is in the yeah. fact that Vlad is going to come in three separate stat blocks, which indicate the three separate forms that you can fight him in. And again, if you're doing a longer term campaign, the idea is that you can fight him at a moderate level, a high level, and a scary level. Um, and so we have the crypt starved form, which is Vladimir von Draken has woken up, but has not regained his power. Strahd might be able to stand toe to toe yes. him at this form. Yeah. But, uh, it would still be a tough battle and I would, I would still put money on Vlad, but if Vlad gets his hands on the blood of royalty, he may be able to recharge his power and and gain his reborn form, which is now going to become a epic vampire knight with giant wings who is really tall, kind of sexy, and terrifying. Um, <laughs> then if he decides to maybe dabble in delirium a little too much, he may ascend to his most powerful form where his true bat, dragon, and wolf elements all come out and he grows into a massive vampire beast, um, which is his ascended form. Yeah. Uh, so all three versions of Vlad we are going to probably unlock uh, by the end of maybe this stream. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And uh, and yeah, so that th those are the three versions of Vlad. And what I love about the, the the whole vampire, the whole court of the night, is really powerful, but really manipulative and sneaky. And so they infiltrate. They've been working on getting. Vlad resurrected for a very long time. And if you know anything about vampires, they got all the time in the world in some cases. So they can make plans that are centuries long. So the plan to bring Vlad back has been in the works and they have been yeah. hiding in the shadows underneath the royalty of, of um, Westamar. And actually, uh, Joe, Jill, uh, you guys may have caught on to this. We actually entirely missed an arc in the show that could classic, have classic led to yeah. Vlad. There was there was an arc presented to us. We dabbled in part of it, and then we actually never bit the thread that would have led to Vladimir yeah. von Drak. For, for for a few people listening in okay. chat, Vlad 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 was after the Sorcerer Kings, long after actually, uh, but before the Edicts of Lumen. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, that that's kind of where. Um. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Kevin Cassidy. There might be a little bit of Ganondorf uh, inspiration. Uh, oh yeah. In we were in, playing a lot of in, Zelda in, in in here. Yeah, we've been playing a fair amount, fair amount of Zelda. Would, so, would uh, would you consider these vampires to be a hidden faction in Dragonheim? You could run them that the yeah. way. Yeah. You you could. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, but definitely, they're they're much more antagonistic and power hungry than uh than than that but like um yeah we we um Court of the night was suggested in season one i think solidified in season two um but and and it's very clear like we you'll know it when you see it in season two because we literally had an opportunity to go to the crypt mm -hmm. uh not knowing what would be there but you know spoilers yeah vladimir yeah. von draken is buried in his crypt Yes, right. So uh, it, it's uh, there's a sign. There's a sign saying where he's buried. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Just follow the, follow the arrows. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it'll it'll be a fun fun thing, and and just in, in general for anyone that wants a bunch more cool vampire stat blocks, um, we've got and fun stuff. We got a bunch of different vampires. Basically, a, a vampire version of 
almost every class. So like we have a vampire it's, rogue, it's a vampire to, cleric, yeah. vampire mage, vampire paladin, um, and, and they're a, meant to represent yeah. like the pillars of a of a of a society. So they can actually infiltrate and take over a society by standing in for the priest, the assassin, the king, the steward. The like the, they have something that represents a lot of different pillars of the community, so that when they infiltrate, mm -hmm. that's what they do. They take yeah. over, they take over the staples of that community, and then feed on the population. Uh, the court of the night is probably one of my favorite bits because it 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 presents a really compelling idea that I think a lot of people will be inspired for alternate campaigns with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so th that'll be a, be a lot. Uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to to what people think of that whole chapter, especially with uh, with the 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 three form epic boss that is uh, that is Vladimir von Racken. Um, and and it's worth noting that the the way we've done this is you you might have seen some some stat blocks where it's like the players fight all three forms in sequence, but what we're kind of doing is that with these three forms is is it's three separate encounters that you might have at three separate points in the campaign, or that you could have them all together, depending on how that uh, goes. Ronson's Klein Castle was, uh, well, um, you know, for lack of spoilers, I already said too much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Some yeah. people may not be there in the show, so. Shh. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. The minis say they're unassembled. Eagle One wants to know. This may be a dumb question. There's no dumb questions. Uh, but what does that involve to assemble them and assume they are like normal, uh, uh, and to assume like they are normal minis? Yeah, uh, a, a, a drop of glue uh, in in some cases because the factory designs haven't been finalized. We don't know exactly how much assembly some of them will will require. That that kind of gets done at the factory, um, and so they, there will be a little bit of glue gluing needed to to put them together. Um, but uh, any sort of super glue or, or I don't know if you if plastic glue will be appropriate for them or not. I'll have to double check. Um, but uh, yeah, Joe, Jill, um, mm -hmm. I I said that, but now I need to think of a question to ask you. Um, I want I I want to I want to get conversation rolling with you guys. Um, okay, you you saw all of the minis now. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean I, that's kind of the same question that was before, but let's talk about the minis. Uh, What's your what are your favorite minis? What are some of the cool minis that you saw? Bringing them up now. Mm. Uh the humongous fungus troll. Yeah, he's the best. He's so just, good. And seeing him in real life and yeah. um he just has this like <laughs> he just has like he's almost like a mini stand too. Like you feel like you could put someone on top of him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> little he's yeah. a little walking uh, end table. He's so big. He's actually huge and uh I think that's what makes the the deluxe set so appealing too. It's like you get such such cool minis and oh yeah. And then but obviously you have to get the Bruce plushie. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, also the, don't little, the little fungus trolls. The little they're oh, cute. Yeah. yeah. They're These cute. guys, they look how cute he is. And you can paint little teethies on them. Yeah. The the painting studio was Four Realms of Chaos. You can find them on Instagram. They are uh, based just outside of Toronto uh, here, and they have been wonderful to work with. They painted the Duchess and other miniatures for us as well, and and um, I will be going back to them for much, much more. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of unpainted terrain and minis that I need to get painted up because I've got a book to write. And I don't have time to paint all that right now. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been a fair amount. They they've been wonderful to work with. Uh, another mini that I really like is the. Uh the reanimata and oh. uh, as part of the abomination set and uh i actually love fighting them too because they are so driven <laughs> yeah we've yeah. actually they don't stop. They don't stop. Yeah. and that's what i think makes them such a scary uh threat because you know it feels almost um yeah. supernatural they're they're like they're their determination yeah uh, which is such a fun yeah we, okay, we have, actually I have a, oh, we have a ahead. non it doesn't have a mini but there is a, an, an upgraded version that's much bigger that is a large creature called the reautomata tanker 
and um, it's uh, it, its special ability is uh, right now it's currently called Maximum Overdrive. Uh, that might not be the final name. And when it activates Maximum Overdrive, it is immune to everything for one round. Um, and then at the end of that duration, it explodes. <laughs> so you have one round. To yeah. Get. Get away far from away it. from it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and like, is this explosion like a fireball or is it yeah, more than it's, a fireball? Yeah, it's, it's okay. like a little more than a fireball. And yeah, it, and, and while it's in maximum overdrive, it, uh, I think we're, we're, it does, ex it does more damage and has advantage. And like, but I think it, it might yeah. also be like slowed or something so that you actually have an opportunity. No, to... uh, no, it's not slowed. It's, it's still, oh, it, it isn't, it isn't fast as a creature, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's pretty brutal. I, I actually do have a great question for you guys, uh, Joe and Jill. Um, were we so somebody asked this in chat, so I'm going to take the question in chat and relate it into a question for you guys. We are hoping to include as many of the monsters that we have seen in the show in this book, as well as monsters from the previous books. So not from this play test, but from just the series of Drakenheim, which monster? Uh, do you think would probably have the coolest stat block? Uh, we're still working on a lot of them, but this includes we're going to be revamping a lot of the bosses from the first campaign. We're going to be revamping uh, some of the creatures that we fought in the second campaign, and some of the some of the more notable monsters that you may remember from even recent arcs are going to probably be popping up. So, any any memories from the show that you're like, I would love to see this monster in this book. Oh yeah, uh, I mean it. It I, I don't know. It might already be in there, but the Duchess, I know, um, would be. <laughs> so a the fame. Duchess. I know the, the Duchess, Duchess was in the last one, but but she she might become an epic boss in this one. Yeah, yeah. I want I want to fight the Duchess again, especially yeah. as uh, as Wrath, uh, Rudy, and Wilhelm. Oh, we we need it. We need a round two. Uh, hey, the I, chat's I, calling out bigger Linda. Yeah, bigger, bigger Linda. Linda. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we There's we no one. we do have a couple couple stat blocks that are like that that are that are here's a lower one version of the monster and here's like an upgraded version of it. So we're doing <laughs> this that is the with, one that slept in the haze too. Yeah, long so we're something. doing that with Big Linda and Bigger Linda. We have Everett Freed and Everett Freed, um, like Apotheosis Everett Freed. Um, and then we have, I think we're going to do the Rat Prince as Rat like Prince low and level. Rat Prince Ascended. Yeah. And then Vlad, Vlad obviously, is, is, is the last one. You know, one that we actually just threw in recently, um, we realized that we needed to put the King Killer Hydra in there. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the thing, is the thing going to make it in? Because the thing was actually using awkwardly a stat block that we actually wrote, but it was for a different project. Uh, well, it was a much higher level version of it. And also, so the, we'll that's, figure it out. that was a very cheaty. It, so there's there's two pe things that people ask for that I'm like, I know I want to put them in the book, but I don't know how because they weren't actually one monster. So the the, the first one is the thing. I didn't run it as one monster. I I literally ran it as like a bunch of different stat blocks that it could it, it just could change change its form entirely depending on the situation and it just changed its stat block. Um, and then the other one was the mimic ship. Oh that, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> that wasn't really a monster. It was more just like a bunch of little monsters attached to an environment. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah. So the mimic ship was was not like a one singular monster. It was more of an environment, and all of the like basically it was the mouths of the mimic ship were individual monsters, right? One thing that we might the be stairs, doing though is <laughs> in the Drakenheim horror, horrors of Drakenheim section, we might include a sort of super mimic, which you could yes. then adapt we to. Yeah. any form any like shape or building yes or we, 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 we we have an urban mimic called the living city um that <laughs> that is yeah, so like if, yeah it's like what if a could run the living yeah. city yeah so so yeah city. i get i guess the mimic house could be could, we could do a variant which was the mimic ship yeah yeah that could we ever totally gonna work. see sten can we ever fight sten as a boss could he be a sten a, 
but Sten was just a scout. Like he basically just <laughs> he, used. There like, will be a stat block for Sten. The, the it's going to be the the, the scout. <laughs> he can yeah. die easily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah why did he touch it why would you be that inquisitive and get paid that little money because because consequ- be- actions have consequences joe and you needed to yeah. learn and you still have it <laughs> oh so it was for me not for sten he was used to teach me the lesson and did you yeah. learn i learned nothing <laughs> i learned nothing from that yeah. uh the the schaffberg mind flayer is the uh far dweller now yeah. um so the far dweller is in this book Yes, and, we, we, uh, we have made sure, yeah, like sometimes, you know, you have to, because we are still working on our own IP, uh, we have to make sure that like our, we want an alien entity that has wiggly tentacles, we need to make it very distinct from, from Wizards yeah, and Mind Flayers, yeah. It's no longer a Mind Flayer, it, I know it was in the show, but we wanted to make something unique and bespoke, so the Far Dweller is our creepy space monster that... Yeah that i think is creepier than so so yeah. a few people have also asked the executioner 2.0 and th- this is actually one of the ones that i'm kind of waffling on because we i do want to put him in the book as an epic boss but if the execution so one of the things that i'm actually thinking of doing with that stat block is p- trying to do a skill challenge in the form of a monster stat block and it's a stat block that is entirely based around the skill challenge of running away. <laughs> um, because I think I think one of the biggest things that I regret about the executioner is not putting in the executioner can't die yeah. in the stat block. Uh, I, I've noticed a lot of DMs run the executioner like a boss monster that is meant to be defeated by the players, but that's very not the design intent of the executioner. The design intent of the executioner is that you need to run um, and you need to get past it. Um, and so that might be my my version of like, how do you write an epic boss that the players can, like that the, the general intent is that the players are gonna run from it. Um, because a lot of the epic bosses that we've written so far um, kind of force the players to be like, fight me, like fight me. <laughs> um and uh uh yeah and they they very much have a health bar right so um even though it's one that scales so and and at the same time like there's a part of me that like wants a very intelligent group to still be able to take down the executioner but not in a traditional combat like it it needs to be more of a, a like you were smart and you did something interesting that was outside the box not you just threw numbers at it and until it died like crush it with something yeah or trap it in something or send it somewhere else i feel like i see only two options you either run away or you use it to kill your enemy yeah 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 (laughs) and then run away and then run away again (laughs) promptly yeah yeah I th- I don't know if you can trap the executioner. I feel like it. I if feel you it. Crush him under a bunch of rocks, like you, a tower. You, you, like you drop can, a tower on him. Like like the executioner. The in terms of like raw power, the execution. Well, I mean, I guess the the Incredible Hulk has been trapped. But like, think of what you had to do to trap the Incredible Hulk. Like, you can't drop a building on the Hulk. That's not enough. No. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think. I think. Okay, I might be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure in the comic books they dropped a planet on the Hulk and he still was like, I'm good. So, you know. I've yeah. I've I don't know. I I, I might be fuzzy so if, on that, but so if it, that's a homebrew decision, but if you hit your executioner with a planet, it's DM's discretion if it <laughs> yeah. survives. It, it yeah. might work. It might yeah. not though. It might not. Mm. Um, John fine. Doe wants to know, um, will PC Apothecaries be able to make some of the monstrosities in the chapter? No. Um, the Pretty much all the monsters in this book are intended to be adversaries for the player characters and not things that they can control um, uh, or, or summon. Because um, then you're now evil if you yeah, make yeah. three automata. The, 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 they're evil. <laughs> gen- generally speaking, um, I'm, of the, uh, I'm of the mind that like, 
there there probably needs to be a subset of rules that govern player characters having companion creatures whether those companions are recruited summoned or crafted in some way and and right now like i feel like in 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 fifth edition it's like if if something of the player is meant to be able to control it 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 needs to generally work like the new generation of summoning spells in the Beastmaster Ranger, where it's like it is a subclass feature or a spell, and this is the stat block that you're using, not just getting the carte blanche from the monster manual uh, to to get whatever you want. There's a question in chat. Any friendly creatures? Here's what I'll tell you: Drakenheim is not a friendly place. Most of the monsters in this book are not friendly, but we have unlocked five stretch goals that include. NPC stat blocks, and they have the potential to all be friendly, depending on which faction you yeah. back. So, and those are the those are the friendlies. And they're not. And many of the monsters in the book do have role playing traits to interact with them in in a mm. not violent manner. Um, if, yeah. If, if you if you want to. Um, uh, um, in, incidentally, there are actually no beasts in this book. Uh, they're all monstrosities, aberrations, undead, handful of fiends, maybe some fey, couple constructs, some elementals, but there are no no new options for druids, sadly. I think Veo ate them all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very those, realistic. That, that Fifteen <laughs> years, like she could she could put a extinct quite a few species. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, do we have, so have a couple more questions from chat? Yeah, I'm looking through. Um, people are loving uh, the Bruce of Holding. Uh, Any kissable cute creatures or rules for kissing? <laughs> no, sadly. sadly. You, can I I you can try. I try. I try. Just you can try. Just grapple with your face. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. want uh, the one. The one kissable creature that we have, I think, is the uh, chemistral. is very kissable. Oh, what about what about the fungal trolling? Don't you just want to give that little guy a smooch? <laughs> <There you go. laughs> I also think uh, we we just uh, we finished a stat block for the. Uh, it's either going to be called the sewer gator or the greater gator. Uh, we haven't decided yet, but it's it's pretty kissable. Who doesn't want to kiss an alligator that's fifty feet long? No. I don't. I don't. No. Yeah. No yeah. takers. No. No. Uh, to buggy. Um, I backed the Kickstarter and joined the VIP server, but I don't really use Discord. Will I miss out on any info or announcements if I don't pop in? Or will Kickstarter email tell me everything I need? You will get all the essential information from Kickstarter from here on out. We're still going to be keeping the VIP server up uh, for for chatting around and and hanging out. Um, and uh, we we currently are discussing. Um, this isn't finalized yet, so please don't quote me on this one, is that after the Kickstarter ends, we're going to convert the VIP server to a server for all backers. So we'll invite all the backers to that server um, so that there is a, so that there is a place where backers can communicate. Um, particularly the reason why we, we thought about that is that it would probably be really useful for playtesting the monsters to have all of the place where backers can communicate and form groups um, and for playtesting stuff like that and, and and whatnot. So we we're still ironing out exactly how that's going to work logistically, but yeah, cur the, but the current idea is to to uh, cha is it's going to stay a VIP server through the campaign, but then at the end of the campaign, once all the the pledges are done. Uh, everyone will get an invite to that. Uh, all the backers will get an invite to that server. I've got a few good questions here that I'm going to throw in. First of all, Delirium Dragon is in the book. Yeah, we have now yep. unlocked the stretch goal for the Delirium Dragon mini, Woo! and we will have a Delirium Dragon of every level of dragon in yep. the book. The other question that I want to dig into before Joe has to go, because uh, Joe will be leaving us uh, shortly, but um, Joe. You got to craft an item recently on the show. Um, what yeah. do you think of the new crafting rules? Uh, somebody asked if there's any new magic items. We have a crafting system and a ton of new magic items. There might be so too Joe, many. We might have to cut. We some. might need to cut some. <laughs> yeah. uh, but Joe, tell us about tell us about your experience with the crafting system, the non spoiler version. Um, well, what 
I think Monty and Kelly have created is a very uh, kind of intuitive and like forward moving crafting system. And, and uh, I'm going to try to give my summary, but uh, definitely fill in the blanks. But the idea is, is that you start to harvest and collect these monster parts and there's sort of different options you have when you're fighting these different monsters and it's not available for things like beasts or humanoids and the idea is is that you can kind of grab one of these really cool parts from a monster um such as uh bones uh natural weapons hide blood um and this really cool idea this animus um so this like kind of like it's like magical essence and what we were able to do is sort of like come together as a team grab some of these parts and craft this cool item that sort of has all of these bits. Uh, and I found it really rewarding because it felt like there was a secondary goal to these like encounters, you know, we sort of joked like, Oh, this is the thing we got to go fight next. Cause we sort of had this recipe that we had collected and mm. it gave us sort of uh, almost like a, a, a fill in the blanks. Like, Oh, we got this part. Now we only need to fight one more thing. And then we find that thing, we kill it. And then it's like, there's a- almost this sense of like excitement as you finally get the last component that you need. And, and and you know i'll keep that weapon for years to come like it's probably one of the things that i uh hold closest to my heart and uh, <laughs> i don't think I'll, i don't i don't think uh, i don't think i could ever let it go one one other aspect of crafting that uh that i that i think you could also speak of is we had to go to some interesting places to actually create the weapon uh so one of the rules that we we're also using is you don't once you've gotten the parts and you have the recipe there's one more component joe do you do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, the uh, and and I think this is such a cool. We we sort of I I I loved this idea. We had this uh, other game where like, um, Monty sort of played that we were doing something. Our characters were doing something really stupid, and <laughs> the, the it angered people, factions, uh, otherworldly entities, uh, demons, gods, uh, what whatever is like your like maybe it's the court of the night. And so there's this idea in the game where depending on the level of magic item or uh, weapon or consumable rarity, you have to go find this forge that you can actually craft this, uh, this magic item in. And so it's not as easy as just like collecting all the parts and being like <laughs> super glue, <laughs> just like shoving it together. You got to go make it um, in a very special forge. And sometimes these forges are not like walk into town style forges. Yeah. So to to elaborate a little bit on that, thank you, Joe. That was excellent. Um, and the forges are kind of locked under the same rarity as the items that you're creating. So a uncommon forge might be in major cities or you know a town that has a renowned blacksmith that a lot of people know about hence uncommon um if you're going rare uh this might be a little bit more bespoke like the capital city with the greatest blacksmith in the realm might be the rare very rare you might be finding the dwarven forge uh, in the heart of a mountain mm-hmm. or in a volcano caldera. And then if you're building a legendary item, you might need to find a forge that's on a rift between worlds or has some sort of extra planar energy tied to it, or you need to harness a sun to fuel. Like, I don't know, just yeah. like wild, yeah. insane stuff. So, so depending on the, on the type of magic item you have, the D at the DM's discretion, you can be like, oh, you want to create this legendary item? Well, you happen to be heading towards the Sun Forge, and they could place it there. Or they could make their own quest and say, hey, you guys got all the items, but you need to make it to the Sun Forge. Do you, do you guys then, have then, some then, ideas for forges that you can share actually, with uh, people? Uh, Monty, what, which one do you want to share? Um, I think one of the cool ones that was unexpected was actually like, bringing the one of the workshops not a forge or a workshop one of them being like a magical spirit tree for wood based items and so you bring the items from the monsters 
and the tree then is the focal point that you gr that the items then grow around the branches of the tree and then you snap the branch off and now you've got your new staff um cool. and so the one because one of the conceits of the system is that the the forge or the workshop is what is providing your characters with all of the mundane uh or stuff that wouldn't come from a creature right so um one of the uh, so in this respect like let's say that you have a magic item that is very clearly made from steel um like a sword well you need a forge for that but the dungeon master can say the forge is at a dwarven mine and the mine has been overrun by cobalts. So in order to activate the forge, the players have to secure the mine first. And the reason why we did it this way is that I just I don't think that there is any compelling way to make gathering resources cool in the confines of D&D. Like it don't get me wrong. I played a lot of World of Warcraft and I remember flying around Netherstorm on my on my dragon <laughs> mining fell iron ore for hours on end and collect doing things like collecting ore and collecting wood or collecting plants Arm. in in that that repetitive grindy way that you see in a lot of video games. It just doesn't work in a tabletop role playing game that is action driven that is narrative driven you can hand wave it right uh, like, yeah you can just it, say like okay you guys took three months and found enough it, trees it, 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 exactly and so yeah. rather than making it a matter of downtime or anything like that we we make those sort of mundane components attached to the workshop and essentially if you want to represent the work that the players have to do to gather that material it is about it, it takes the shape of a quest and and that is at the point that the players can actually engage with something using the traditional like the pillars of play of Dungeons and Dragons, right? Because we we you know and and it just avoids that whole conversation of having to do things of like how many pounds of iron did you coat like like I don't want to do that I I don't want to uh, do that. we're do point three short okay we got to go back from the place. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, at the start, the Sun Forge, because I forgot the last pound. Yeah, of, yeah. No. And, and, and it and it also takes away the the concern about having to tell the dungeon master like after every encounter, you need to make sure that you give your players X number of resources because they're going to need like it, you like in in prior editions of D anD D, there were all these like te treasure tables that like told you like fourth edition was really really specific that it was like here are the treasure parcels make sure you give out every single one of these parcels over the course of every level because your the players have to have it and i just didn't want a system that required that level of bookkeeping and didn't require that level of labor for the dungeon master either so well, it, yeah. i will add on to that and just say like you guys have made it really accessible and easy to pick up so from having experienced that system it isn't a lot of brain power in terms of thinking like what are the exact number of things i need it's pretty easy once you do go through battle and face a monster you know kind of the gist after you've done it a few times of what you can so it becomes less on the dm to eat like you said craft those things and more the players know what they need to get and we're on this quest to get mm -hmm. what we need to do and it gives that kind of reward of you can focus where you want to grow and get these really cool items without having to wait for your dungeon ma master yeah. necessarily to yeah. give you all of that when only when they want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah. And so I, 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 I will let Joe step off. Yeah. Or did you want yeah, to, I, I, I wanted to say like that, that, that building on what Joe was saying, like one of the fun things was like at first you sort of just like grab whatever. And then as you fight more things, you grab what's like cool. And then you start to kind of grab like the fill in the blanks, like, and, and Monty and Kelly, you guys can probably go more into this, but like certain items are more generalized. So they can require like more, um, more general parts. So you might just grab parts that might be useful anytime, but then you also grab certain parts that like you really need. So like, yeah, it didn't feel, um, also didn't feel like, how do I say it? Like restrictive. 
yeah. I, I didn't f- and I, I didn't feel like there was like an underabundance. Like I felt like yeah. there was the right amount of, of of magic items or crafting parts for um what was needed to build cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to address a really fun question from Chad about the crafting system, and I bet a lot of people are going to have this question. Uh, I believe it was Lewis Gale asks, how would you implement forges into the original Drakenheim campaign? Mm. And Monty and I actually talked about this the other day. I, I think if you were using this in the Drakenheim campaign, Tobias Crow is an uncommon forge. The Smithy on the Scar is a rare forge. Uh, I believe the very rare was the, in the Academy Tower. Yeah, it's yeah, and it's, yeah. the legendary. I think and you Castle have to, Draken. Yeah, you can and ever, Castle Draken was yeah. very rare. Where was the legendary forge? Uh, there isn't one. I th- oh. I think there was talk of like you could yeah. create one in the heart of the crater. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, but there is but um but I got smished there. Were were there might only be like legendary forges are the type of thing that where there's like you can count on one hand how many of them are exist in the setting. Like we that, know where they are in the setting. I think we talked yeah. about like there's where where so actually while well, we visit one in this actual place series that's airing right now. So you will find out where one legendary forge is. How you get to it in your campaign? Uh, good luck. Um, <laughs> you have to do what Pluto does. Uh, yeah. You'll have to follow in his steps. Follow, yeah. fo- follow me. Um, and it just, <laughs> just really quick, like, congrats, like, look, at, we're at four forty four, eight twenty. I think that uh, you're going to close in on that four fifty goal soon. So, congratulations. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Joe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have to sign off tonight. But I really want to thank everybody for supporting the Kickstarter. Um, please uh, don't be shy if you're part of the Discord. Please message me. Um, I have some free time later this week that I'd love to talk about the Kickstarter and what's exciting, but yeah, have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night, sir. Bye, Joe. Bye, Joe. Cheers. Bye. Uh, we're still going to hang out for a little bit though. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. We yeah. Are. We're going to hang out for, for, for a little bit, um, with, with apologies for, for the zoom call, uh, kind of going, uh, a little, there we go. Okay. There we go. <laughs> yes, the 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 Zoom frames are still in place, uh, but uh, that uh, there we go. I think I should be able to roughly adjust this so that that Jill isn't isn't totally cut in half here. <laughs> Like uh, she was in that one actual. No, I'm joking. No, no. <laughs> well, almost a few times, right? But, um. Yeah, uh, talking a little bit more, there was the, somebody, somebody, I think very jokingly, but they said, uh, I would collect all the parts all the time. And I also want to mention that one of the constraints on the system to make sure that it is in a lot of bookkeeping is we kind of nebulously imply that during battle, parts can be destroyed, things can get damaged, the magic doesn't work properly. And uh, the way that we the way that we do that is that when you finish a battle, every character gets to collect one part. Yeah. If you fight one monster, everybody gets to collect one part. If you fight a hundred monsters, everybody gets to collect one part. Uh, so most combat encounters in our group of three, in any combat encounter we finish, we get three parts at the end of it. We each get to choose what it is. Another thing that I want to say is uh, we we hadn't come up with this during the the episode where we show the crafting system. And at first we were just collecting anything. But one way that we're alleviating that is I feel like having a recipe is really important right off the bat. So Monty and I have always been advocates for wanting tool proficiencies to be more important in D&D 5e. They always feel unimportant um, for the most part. In Sebastian Crows, we introduced tool feats. In this book, depending on your tool proficiency, you are going to get two to three uh, recipes right off the bat. So uh, most of them are you're either getting potions, some specifically health potions, um, scrolls, and then one brand new bespoke item that relates to your tool proficiency. So for example, uh, one of the favorite ones that I worked on, uh, if you are proficient in cook's utensils, 
you can build the ever hot stew pot which requires the heart of a fire elemental uh, the metal of a construct and a few other parts and you can create a cauldron that has a self-heating system and during rests you can make some soup for your comrades that bestows upon them some benefits so they're all uncommon items Mm -hmm. But it sort of gets you a start to say, hey, at the beginning of the campaign, you have a tool proficiency. If you happen to kill some cool monsters, here's something that you could make based on your tool proficiency. Yes. Um, and so to to answer a, a couple uh, quick questions, um, Quinn wants to know, will we, did there be new arcade anomalies in the book? Maybe. Uh, Luke wants to know, will we be getting new delirium dregs? Absolutely, yes. There will be a, There's a whole chapter on new delirium drags uh in in the book uh going all the way from cr1 to cr10 um and so another i think there was another good question earlier about the about the crafting system that i wanted to comment on as well um uh oh thomas wanted to know what are our thoughts on equipment sets they're cool but we haven't made any yet <laughs> um uh for this book but we do we've made them for drakenheim before um and burn did you guys uh, mention about the animus oh yeah the crafting system yeah so the key component of the crafting system is that every item requires an animus from a creature animus being kind of like the residual magical energy of a, a magical creature that must be captured in an animus vessel um delirium crystals work as animus vessels and so when you defeat a monster you can capture its animus in a shard of delirium and this is why delirium is so valuable in the setting of drakenheim because Previously, if you needed to make a uh, animus vessel, it was a labor intensive process that required harvesting lots of monster components and you had to build them. Whereas delirium just works. It just works. It just works. It just works. Um, <laughs> it, it just works. And so um, that, that means that harvesting animus is always an option. Um, instead of collecting a part from a monster because and because every magic item needs an animus you'll always need need that uh, access to the number of vessels um we we do have a ways we do have a, a, a set of rules for making a vessel that is not made from delirium so that you can use this crafting system in a non-drakenheim campaign um but uh the 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 delirium delirium makes it way easier in Drakenheim. In 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 general, you need fewer monster parts, um, and so that uh, that element of it combined with the rest of the monster parts means that you got a you got an item. And so, for example, if you some items do have some other requirements, like for example, if you want to make a spell scroll, you have to know the spell you're making the scroll of, um, and so you can't just make a spell that you don't know um and the the spell scroll is a, a good example of this where to make a spell scroll under the system you need the hide of a monster you need the the fluid usually blood of a monster and you need a captured animus and all three of those parts must come from a monster with a challenge rating equal to twice the spell's level so you want to make a level five spell scroll, uh, a scroll of wall of force, get the animus from a CR 10 creature, get the hide from a CR 10 creature, get the blood from a CR 10, 10 creature. Then you Similarly, gotta... uh, the potions as well. Somebody was asking, uh, and I thought this was really important uh, that we talk about where was it? How much stuff will I need to make a common healing potion? So we wanted consumables. Mm -hmm to be accessible right off the bat. So like Monty said with the scroll, as opposed to a, an item that has really specific parts, like you need the fangs of a CR 10 or higher vampire lord, um, some items might require something like that. But scrolls and potions are generally going to be just, you need these parts, categories, from uh, the right CR monster. So potions yeah. require any, any blood, any organ, or not any, sorry, any fluid, any organ, and any animus. Yeah, and so so we kind of make a fun joke that, like, there's a lot of different recipes for healing potions. So, like, maybe one person's recipe for a healing potion is 
um, Manticore drool plus a Minotaur's eyeball uh, mixed with the animus of a harpy. And that can make a healing potion. Um, one of the things that we've also discussed with healing potions specifically is that we think that the healing potion recipe might produce more than one potion um, for every uh, every time you make it. Um, and so that, whereas other potions, that might not be the case, right? A potion of heroism, potion of invisibility, potion of flying, these are much more powerful, so you make one. Whereas potions of healing, we want them to be an easy thing that characters can make readily. Uh, and that that is like, if you don't know what to do, if you don't know what monster parts to get, get organs, get fluid, get animus, make potions. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to move on to the next topic, Jill, another thing that you and I have had to deal with in the recent episodes is our brand new Deadly Conditions. Oh, yeah. Um so I want to I want to start that conversation because we've talked about a lot of things that are in this book but another thing that's going to be in this book is a ton of brand new conditions. Jill, which condition has has ruined your day the most? Um <laughs> Does existential dread count? <laughs> Oh yeah, that was a fun. Not that quite. was a fun one. Yeah, that that <laughs> definitely a... that that one hasn't been made into a condition yet, but maybe it should be. Maybe it should. Yeah, May I, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I was can... a creature's ability, but um, yeah, that but was... actually, dread as a condition might be pretty. Yeah, good. I think I think yeah. taking those effects, but also um, yeah. we had burning, frozen. We haven't seen yeah. shocked yet. Um. I don't. I can't, I'm trying to remember what else happened to you. Uh, I mean, I know that Jill gets hit really hard with the existential dread in one of the upcoming episodes. Um, but um. burning was really interesting too because um, I remember when we were, uh, and I guess, guess this episode already aired. Is that when we were facing the trolls? Is you forget about it for a second, but it's ongoing damage. And I think because I didn't put it out. It took me down in one in one of the turns, yeah. so it's it's just really interesting to consider that it's it's ongoing, and you need to consider like what are you going to do with your action when you have one of these conditions because it does yeah. like stack up in a way that can be really really interesting. One of the bits of feedback we got from the playtesters at GaryCon was that burning instead of it being at the start of your turn, you take the damage at the end of your turn, you take the damage. Mm. And that way you've got the immediate choice. Are you going to stop, drop and roll right now? Yeah. Or are you going to just do what you wanted to do and eat the damage? And so we might send burning into playtesting with that as an, do an AB test of that and see what feels better. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it was pretty, it was a pretty good, good effect. Mm hmm. Yeah, what are what are um, some of the other conditions in the book? Some of my favorite. Okay, so there's two that have been, or there, yeah, there's two that have been a bit of a shorthand. Um, and we did do a lot of conditions that are intentionally meant to be shorthands because cutting down page count means we can fit more things. And there's also just a lot of phrases that are used over and over again in D and D. And you're, I wonder why they're not conditions. Example. Defenseless means that all attacks against you have advantage. Helpless, any attack against you has, is a crit. Slowed, your speed is halved. Immobilized, your speed is zero. These seemed obvious to me. Um, one of my favorite things is that when you're frozen, you become helpless to bludgeoning damage. Um, so what happens is you can get frozen and then hit with like a club. And it's going to do double damage. There was a great scene in our playtest where I was playing a warlock with repelling blast against a frost or the winter troll. And the winter troll froze me. And I thought I was being clever by repelling blasting it over and over again, being like, haha, you'll never get up to me with your club. I'm fine. Um, and then he picked up a crate and threw it at me. Yep. And that did massive damage. But once you take 20 bludgeoning or fire damage, you get knocked out of frozen. Um, mm -hmm. So I really like helpless being a condition that you can use either as you're helpless until the end of the turn, or you can even make helpless related to something specific. You're helpless against fire damage. You're helpless against bludgeoning damage. And that that's sort of a cool way to just say, mm. 
The next attack against you of this damage type is going to crit you. Hey, Kelly, uh, the Legends of Avantress just dropped in the chat. Uh, oh, we love chat. Legends yeah. of Avantress. Uh, huge congrats on the amazing launch. We can't wait to slay monsters while cr cranking metal. So much fun hanging out with you at Gary Khan. We love you. We love you guys. Um, uh, you you lot are, are, are such a blast. Um, it, it was it was really, really uh, so much fun uh, to to chat with, with all of you. It's some really wonderful conversations with uh, with with the gents from Legends of Avantress at uh, at uh, at our panel uh, at the la uh, just hanging around at, at Gary Con. I think actually when we first arrived on on Thursday, they were there uh, at. They were uh, the first people we yeah, really they, got to hang yeah, out with. Yeah, they were the first ones we got to hang out with, and it was. And so we're always good to excited see. to see them. Yeah, yeah, uh, it 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 really was a a lot of fun, uh, and and uh, every uh, honestly, the uh, I have to say for myself, like um, going to cons uh, since since we met uh, met that crew. Um, I mean, like, I can't wait till I run into, um, run into, run into these folks because they've been such a, such a, an, an awesome group of people to, to, to hang out with. So Richie, Mikey, Derek, Andy, you four are, are such, <laughs> such awesome guys. So, uh, uh, please, we look forward to seeing you probably at Gen Con next, I think. Uh, yeah. 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 We'll be, we'll be chilling. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, so other than that, I, I mean, that kind of covers all of the major components of the book. We got our epic boss, or we haven't talked about epic bosses yet, have we? No. Um, Jill, the only yeah the the epic boss that you fought was obviously the humongous fungus troll. Um, what do you what do you like about epic bosses, or what do you hate? I, again, same question. Yes. They basically are the same question. Yeah, I mean, I find them just to be next level in terms of uh, a difficulty a way that you have to consider strategy when you're fighting them because it is different than a regular higher cr or monster you have to consider like what are the actual abilities what are you coming across what strategy as we learned in our last episode do you have to have to fight yeah. them because you have to think about it a little bit more because they're not typical yeah. yeah. Um, when we were driving back from Gary Khan, Kelly and I were, were going over a lot of this and we were saying um, we looked at uh, we were looking at 10th level characters and I said, OK, so in a party of four 10th level characters, uh, they on average, if you, if you do wizard, cleric, fighter, rogue. Um, wizard, cleric, fighter, rogue. What am I? Missing? Wizard. Wait, yeah. wait. Wizard, cleric, oh, fighter, rogue. Yeah, wizard, cleric, fighter, rogue. Uh, That's four, at yeah. 10th level with reasonable builds, they have about 300 hit points total. Um, and so our epic, the what uh, CR, uh, uh, an epic boss that is meant to fight a uh, level 10 party is CR 15. So the guidance that we get with, with epic bosses is they're they're generally 50% above the level of the party in challenge rating. So like a, a, a level eight party, you want to throw a CR 12 epic boss at them. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the epic bosses, um, the kind of the, the difficulty level that we're going for is that we want the epic boss to knock out at least one player character during the battle and most other player characters should be knocked down to at least half their hit points uh, by the end of the fight. And so what we, on the flip side of that, we also want the players to have to like fight smart. So um, we've kind of calibrated the damage from, of an epic boss to fully kill the party over three rounds unless they do something to prevent it. So an, mm -hmm. a, a, an epic boss, uh, a challenge rating 15 epic boss, um, going up against a 10th level party, we want them to be able to do about 100 damage per round to the party, um, regardless of dice rolls uh, on its end. Um, and so the party has to like actually do something to survive uh, the, those three rounds. And and generally, five, three to five rounds is our target length for how long we want uh, a, a confrontation to be. The yeah, low, we, we found... Oh, I think the ahead. lowest CR epic boss is CR 10. And it is isn't the it this guy? It might be, yeah. Yeah, I think so. 
Um, the Epic bosses really ride this fine line I found, and we we got to play test this guy both in our actual play that you just saw tonight, if you watched it, and also Monty and I brought it to GaryCon and tried it out twice there. And what was really awesome is it was reliable. Mm. The party always had to uh, think outside the box a little bit, but at no point was there a TPK. Um, but it always felt like one person went down, one person was at like three to 10 hit points and the other couple people were like at about half hit points yeah. when they, when they were glow, when they like had glorious victory, which always felt great because yeah. everybody survived mm -hmm. and, uh, the Epic boss did its job because the Epic boss's job is to die to a party who, who tries, but it needs yeah. to feel pretty desperate. Um, yeah. Uh, Dive Trainer Dan, this is a popular question. Will the conditions be available for the players to put on the monsters? We're not making player options in this book, so no, but there might be some magic items that do. Um, so generally, the, the conditions here are shorthand for monster stat blocks. Um, and so it'll, it'll have to be the future be before, before this. A lot of the conditions that we've named are things that player abilities do already um but i look, look at i would love to do a full overhaul of like how elemental damage is treated as a player ability but that is a that is a whole that's, prime, a, that's a that yeah that that's a whole other thing <laughs> we are 2k away from vlad um yeah. i really want to see us hit vlad um i'm kind of really hoping it happens in the next half hour before we uh close this out um although it feels like it's got to happen in the next half yeah. hour at the rate it's yeah. been going but uh, uh franimus is a great question does your level plus plus 50 percent equal cr apply to any party size or only a three-person party it applies to any party size because epic bosses scale to your party size both their hit points and their actions dynamically scale based on the number of player characters in your party. Now that is a determined when you roll initiative, right? So if you have a group of five player characters, your epic boss is going to take one epic action after each of them and their hit points are then you're going to do the quick math and determine uh j just like a summoning spell um says like 50 hit points plus 10 per level of the spell. For hit points of your summon monster the epic boss says it has 50 hit points plus 25 hit points per player character so that's that's how it scales dynamically in the, in in that respect um and and then if a player character dies or is unconscious the epic boss keeps going <laughs> um i i i do want to talk about a little rule of thumb though that i actually think is important and it will be a sidebar in the book as a DM running an epic boss, there is an opportunity with an epic boss to be a real jerk. And I yeah. think that it, there's going to be a sidebar saying, don't do this because you get an action after every player character. You could spend all actions pummeling one player character, but that's not fun and that's not good DMing. Yeah, so the, don't do that. <laughs> the way yeah. the epic boss is supposed to function is almost as a reaction to each player character with exceptions at the dm's discretion if the sniper keeps sniping you and you haven't gotten a hold of it but you have an ability like this guy to yank them towards you even though another player character might be right up against you and attacking you you might be like you know i'm gonna yank the archer towards me because that's cooler but what you shouldn't do is punch the fighter eight times in a row until they're dead yeah um so use your best discretion the fun of an epic boss is the cause and effect of the 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 players going and you responding uh so you play around with that a little bit more and that's how you make an epic boss sing don't don't mm -hmm. be a jerk with epic bosses wes wtf uh thanks for the super chat i'm not if i'm not playing in drakenheim and i use this book how do you harvest an elemental well if it's an earth elemental uh you will be able to uh scoop up parts of its body if it's a fire elemental it'll leave ashes behind if it's a water elemental you'll be able to scoop up some leftover ele water elemental and if it's an air elemental 
I think you gotta like catch it in a jar or something. I don't know. There'll be some dust left behind by Probably. it. Probably. Yeah. Right. Um. And and so so you you can and you can always and and as as we said with when it comes to animus, um, animus is stored in delirium. But if your world doesn't have delirium, it's lucky. Um. But uh, if your world doesn't have a delirium, uh, we have rules for how your player characters. Uh, use their leftover monster parts to build animus vessels so a lot of people have asked like what if my players have like a bunch of extra monster parts sitting around they can actually use those leftover parts to build anima to, to build animus vessels to capture animus instead we are 500 dollars away from vlad so close Just, i'm woo! watching it so that's, that's, <laughs> only one person has to go all in and we're there all right you know so hey Someone in hey, chat. Hey, hey. Uh, go, go for it. Go, go for it. Uh, um, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Empathogen says you guys keep getting cooler and cooler art. Your stuff is better than most official art books art nowadays. I, they have some very talented artists working on the official books too, uh, and some of them have worked on our books. <laughs> so uh, the uh, I I would I would just say that like I think that for many of the artists that work on our books. Uh, we we get to I feel like we get to push the envelope on the horror that you don't necessarily see from the first party books. Uh, we we do stuff that is pretty gross. Um, so that that's that, that's a very fun, I mean, fun thing. I mean, like, yeah, that's not a good time. Actually, the one behind Monty is horrifying of the dude. Yeah, I, I, honestly, the Bojack <laughs> is one of both of those. But the Bojack is one of the creepiest and most disturbing creatures I think I've ever yeah. seen. Uh, the Vlad von Draken campaign, uh, you're probably going to want to start that around level 13. Um, that, that's kind of what we're thinking. Again, we don't, we're, yeah, it's, it, it's a tier three, tier four campaign. Yeah. Uh, Kate Kirby, and thank you for no AI. Yep. Yeah, no, we, we only work with human, human artists on, on all of this. And so one of the things that we are going to be doing in Monsters of Drakenheim is we talked to our layer editor is the artist's name will appear by all of their pieces, uh, as well. So, uh, you will, you will know that there was a human being that created this, this thing and, and a human being that, that wrote it. Um, we hit Vlad. Ah, unleashed. Blood. Unleashed. Uh, so good, so good. Um, this is this is gonna be fun. Now we actually have to write them. Uh, although the, the, the there's, there's we have we have a lot of notes for them, yeah. so we just need to solidify yeah. that. Uh, speaking of art and our human artists, uh, I know that three of the prime examples are literally right here on screen. But Jill, favorite art that you've seen? The one that you have, Ooh. yeah, or or. Uh... I mean, this one is pretty epic, only because I love seeing Rudy, the characters, Wilhelm, yeah, yeah ha like seeing the characters in the scenes is always my favorite. Just seeing them imagine, but I mean, the cover art is yeah. pretty epic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. all amazing though. Every time I see just the new art, seeing it come to life, like actually seeing it on the Kickstarter page was just mind blown when I saw it this morning. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, there's something amazing about seeing our characters in like action shots uh, in the book. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. Oh, so good. Uh, we can't share this, but we already have uh, sketches, not official artwork, of all three Vlad forms. Uh, we're going through a few final touches on them. Um, but Monty and I we're really hoping for this stretch goal. So we were already working with Marius on uh, what we, what we wanted Vlad to look like in all three uh, yeah. of his yeah. forms. So he's, he's going to be pretty, pretty, pretty beefy. Um, super, super cool. If you've ever Jill wanted, to see this. yeah. If you've ever wanted to yeah. see a plate armored winged vampire Lord, uh, you're going to, you're going to like uh, his, yeah. his, his main form. Um, Speaking of um, art, there was a question about what the digital art book is about. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? It, yeah, yeah, Kelly. Uh, the digital art book, very simply, is going to be a a just collection of all of the incredible art in our book without the words. Uh, so some people, especially digitally, some people like to show the art like this. If you were about to fight the humongous fungus troll 
and it's trolling. So you might pop this up on your digital screen during on your VTT to be like, here's the horrible scene of the the mon- yeah. also like the digital art of each monster. If you wanted to show your players that not only VTT but in person, I often will have like my computer screen and I'll just be like, here's what it looks like. Um, and mm-hmm. so the digital art book is just going to be a tool for you to have easy access to all of the art in the book. Yeah. Alberto Casasso, uh, Casado Gomez uh, says, I love you guys, but I don't really like the horror theme. Are there any plans to create any non-horror RPG books? I think it's hard because I think Kelly and I as authors are very driven by horror. I think we really like the psychological element of it. Um, and um, the and as a genre in role-playing games, I think we really like it. I think that we're going to explore some other genres, but all of my work is going to have a dark edge to it. That's just the type of creator that I am, and and um, I I'm not I, I'm not the type of person that is necessarily capable of of making like I, I like, can't like, do I can't do I can I can do whimsy, but like I can do whimsy as long as there's still blood and guts. You you know what I mean? Like my my take on whimsy is like american mcgee's alice in wonderland right like yes yeah right um i take on whimsy yeah it's it's like it's like the whimsical with with the like the original uh charlie and the chocolate factory that's my whimsy where kids get possibly killed um <laughs> and and tunnels with boats are like the creepiest thing you've ever seen in your life uh yeah. that's whimsical to me i don't know if i could do so so this is something that's really interesting i would love to take a crack at doing something like uh, if you guys are familiar with uh Obajimo, which is very much yes. it's a source book inspired by zelda and um studio ghibli um, I, I, so I love Zelda and I love Studio Ghibli. And I think I could take a crack at that because both of those actually have a weird underlying darkness to them. Yes, they, um, they, they, they do. Um, yeah. and, and all I can say is that if you ever see something from me that is very cute and cuddly and adorable and wholesome, that means it's going to be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Because the, the reason yes. to create something beautiful is to is to show what happens when that beauty is threatened or uh, dealing with loss or tragedy. There's there's elements that you can play with in something that is humble and idealistic. Um, well, yeah. I think also we've talked before just around like playing in the campaigns we want to play and, and do in. There is an element, even though we're playing a fantasy game, of the real life, right? And real life isn't all amazing. So we play with those elements and it comes out in this sometimes dark way, which I think is that's just the element of dealing with some of the issues that we want to delve into. Kelly Kelly and I were concepting out, we've been working on the concept for uh, the campaign that one of the campaigns that we want to do after Drakenheim. Um, And we were talking about like, the 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 setting and and what it what it is like and very much the the contrast of of hope and despair mm. is very much going to be at play here <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm really excited i, I don't want to say too much because it's an extreme early development but monty and i one thing that we love to do is we drive to a lot of the cons and we live in canada but the cons that we go to are all in the States. So usually we're driving like between eight and 12 hours, but those car rides with Monty and I are where we do some of our best early creative work. It's usually our brainstorm sessions for early ideas. Mm -hmm. And this, we just went to Gary con and Gary con was the con where Monty and I conceptualized the next campaign. And I personally, uh, the themes and the characters and the world in which that's going to explore I am really, really excited for. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about it, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm kind of vibrating on that right now. Obviously, today I took a break looking at it because it's Kickstarter launch day. Yeah. But yesterday I was very much vibrating on on the on the whole excitement of that. Yeah. Um, we won't say any more. I'm excited to tell Jill about it. 
Because yeah. um, I, I actually texted her yesterday and I was like, uh, we may have mapped out an entire campaign, Jill. I'll tell you about it later. Um, <laughs> but that's that's yeah. still, that's, in, yeah. that's like uh, this though, much in development. Though I don't know, Jill might be unhappy about the character creation rule that you can only play a human or a halfling. No, all halflings okay. I'll yeah. play halfling. Yeah. In, in, uh, unless you come back with something good. I'm back. You, yeah. you either have to play a human, a halfling, or talk to Monty about how another idea fits into the world. Um, the other thing, the the other thing that I am worried about though with Jill, and I want to make sure that we nail this, is we are really going to be playing with um, uh, hope and despair, and I want to make sure that we don't cross any of yeah. anybody's lines. So it's going to be important to us in session zero that we actually talk very deeply about. How much we're willing to add despair to a world of hope um existential dread i'm willing to go through yeah. oh no <laughs> this won't be existential dread this will just be good old-fashioned dread just so uh old yeah good old-fashioned dread <laughs> yeah um we don't know if anyone will play an apothecary yet noah but we do know that uh, the other rule is that no one can play a warlock no one can play a sorcerer no one can play a fighter no one can play a ranger and no one can play a rogue because we already had those in Drakenheim. <laughs> yeah. And and that that's a rule only because I want the players to play something that they haven't that we haven't seen before on our stream. Right? Love that. Yeah. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. Um, but uh but yeah. We had a couple really good que like more again, a couple more lightning round um uh qu type questions here. Um um and Pathogen just gave a super chat a little while ago saying, I want to thank you all for the hours and hours of inspiring content. Wish you so much. I could play a game with you, but watching on YouTube is still great fun. Well, we will be having more convention games and maybe one day we can make that ha make, make that happen. Um, you know, we Gary Con was a really cool opportunity and we will be back at Game Hole Con. Uh, and and uh, Gen Con, we probably won't be running any games, though. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. We might need a rest. But yeah, we'll, yeah. you'll have lots of opportunities to meet us at uh, Gen Con. Yeah, in in, in indeed. Um, a little bit a little bit while earlier, I wanted to to ask. Uh, Drowning in your blood. Wanted to know: Am I able to pledge the core book down that upgraded the ultra, ultimate set and backer kit in six months? Uh, it, we don't know if the backer kit will be six months away or much sooner than that. Just uh, just so you know, uh, but you can get add-ons and uh modify your pledge and backer kit um if you if you do need to make changes uh later um and uh if you uh, um sir lamb uh, fiend wanted to know if you only have sketches what is the art used for the stretch goal for vlad it is like the the mostly complete form of image of his first form um which which might get might go a little bit uh a little bit more um through the the hopper but uh we're pretty happy with it um yeah i think i i hit those um yeah. a lot of people asking i actually we should maybe stick to questions about yeah. the book but a lot of people keep bringing up jill people want you to run humblewood at some point well, yeah yeah i'll yeah. have to play test being a dm at some point mm -hmm. kelly monty yeah we're open we're open um people are also asking about future stretch goals they'll probably be, get, be getting revealed tomorrow morning um we do have a couple more uh there's there's still still more content to add to the book um and there's lots more cool things to throw in there so i'm not sure how many how far we'll reveal the stretch goals from here um we have a lot of ideas uh, as as we get past this point we get into the these are stretch goals that we haven't fully planned yet <laughs> territory uh but yeah. uh but there, there there will be more um any plans for european cons not this year um the just uh getting over overseas i would love to do some traveling over there but no plans for for a european con it's just uh just a, a one one step too far i think uh, as much as i would love to attend some of them Nick must be awake because I didn't even realize we were getting those updates. So that's cool. Oh, oh, great! I just yeah. saw, yeah, yeah. So Vlad, Vlad's first form is in the update, his crypt star form, nice. uh, but that isn't even his final form. This isn't even my final form. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, are we planning on releasing, releasing a physical art book or just the digital release? A lot of people have asked about that, so we're going to talk about it. But right now, just the digital release. I saw a great suggestion. A suggestion that once we do like the, the like eventually, somebody said next Kickstarter. If you have a big book bundle, you should do a coffee table book of all yeah. of the art from all of the books. Yeah, that'd be no. super cool. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be, really be a lot of fun. I would like that very much. I would like that for my own coffee table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I would also like to get some large uh, canvas prints of many of the art pieces for my house, but it's more of a, uh, which ones do I, it's a very difficult choice to be like, which one is the one? I have one. It's yeah. actually right in front of me right now. I have uh, from Sebastian Crow's guide. I have a very large canvas print that I got uh of sebastian in his office writing a letter uh it's the very first image i think in sebastian crow's guide um so that that i have as a canvas print above my computer yeah that that's such a good good choice there's a there's a piece of castle draken from sebastian crow's that i really like as well uh and and a few other like pan, some of the panoramic pieces are are great uh thanks for liking my shirt sure and it's it's one of the official D D the D and D ones um, by uh, uh, um, by I can't pronounce their their them but yeah that's that's the brand um, I really like it too um, uh, you you can see Monty play with me DMing in uh, one, our one shot uh, what is it Pale Man the Pale Man the Plight of the Pale Man yeah uh, so if you look at our Untold Tales of Drakenheim and find Plight of the Pale Man I run that one. And Monty annihilates me as a player yeah. um, with yeah. banishment. Uh, but to say that, relax, fantasy review. I genuinely like DMing more than I like playing, and I kind of reject the notion of being a forever DM. Um, I, like I, I, I feel I don't really relate to that label because I feel like a lot of people who are, I, I feel like there there are many people who call themselves forever DMs because they're not. DMing because they want to, they're DMing because they feel no one else is going to, and so they they say, "Oh, I'm I'm open, always a DM, never a player," and they're sad about it. And I'm not sad about the fact that I always DM. I love DMing and I prefer it immensely over playing. Um, I, I would say I get I get the urge to play like once every couple of years. And usually we start something, and then after three or four sessions, Monty's like, "All right, I scratched the itch. Yeah. We can go back." Yeah. Uh, so I, I do like. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Monty into a short mini arc actual play at some yeah. point that I'm gonna run. Um, my problem is that like Monty is a tactical genius, and I am not. Uh, so I, I'm very fast and loose and improv heavy as a DM, and Monty yeah. is always like, I have the eight spells that will completely undo everything that you have just set up, and and it, he he taught me everything I know because he undoes everything I do, and therefore I have to learn and adapt, uh, which I thank him for. But uh, he's he's <laughs> one of those players that's like, if I never take a point of damage, then I'm doing okay, and I'm like, man, that's that's. That's hardball. Yeah. Um, but I will get Monty into an actual play. It might not be D&D. We might actually... You know what? I really want Monty to play in an alien RPG campaign that I run because I he really was... I really did enjoy that. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I did. I, I also do find that, like, yeah, I, I often get to... I only get to play one-shots and stuff like that. And, like, um, yeah, oftentimes like yeah the i i haven't found the campaign that's made like i haven't been been able to play in too many campaigns that like have made my heart sing conceptually um and so um you know kelly ran several games that i really really enjoyed uh and to this day kelly's the best dm i've ever had um so Thanks. um but 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 yeah like i I definitely am someone that that as a, as a player, I I don't. It's like I dare you to railroad me. I dare you. <laughs> I, no. <laughs> well, um, I will say you're both the best DMs I've ever had. Nah, both of you have been uh, my DMs. So 
I mean, wh- wait, are we the only DMs you've ever had? I've played a few one shots with. Other okay. People. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jill. Jill also helped teach. Me. I mean, the reason why we have the group that we have is because I think uh, Jill and Joe both. Uh, Jill played at my table for a few years, and Joe played with me and Monty um at, at a different table and then jill also taught me a lot about being a dm because uh she turns out immediately the first time she looked at a rule book was like ah i know how to meta game now um not in a bad way not in a bad way i'm mean, sorry not mm-hmm. meta game um min max is the word i meant to use yeah. and not in a negative way but um you were just like Wait, I'm optimization. I'm a, yeah, you were you were so good at optimization that I wasn't ready for it as a young DM. Um, mm-hmm. That I was like, wait, you can fly and snipe people as a flying fighter with a bow. And meanwhile, I was like, but the module I'm running doesn't have anything yeah. to deal with that. And I had yeah. to learn to improv. That was when improv became a very useful skill. And I very quickly learned to... Mm-hmm. throw in the proper monsters to deal with the play group that you have at the table and that the module is just a tool set that suggests things for you to do but sometimes depending on your group you gotta improvise and uh monty and jill have both done a number in teaching me that and joe just uh is the master of improvisation and oh, somehow yeah. rides he rides this line of being the most what are you doing and then somehow you're like did you know all along that you were doing the exact right thing? Like, I don't know how he does it. He fumbles his way into brilliance, and I admire that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> I love uh, that. Kyle did play with us for many years. Uh, he was he was excellent uh, as his druid with one ape arm. Um, he always turned into a scorpion and grappled people. It was great. <laughs> so good. So good. <laughs> Do you, do you all currently have cats? Joe has a cat named Bruce, if you're wondering where that came from. Yeah. Yeah. I have a cat. I have a cat yeah. named Gwenavar. Aw. I mean, D&D. Yeah. <laughs> name, yeah. Uh, that we call Gwen. Yeah. So. I do not have any pets currently. My, my, my lifestyle and living situation doesn't really, it's not really conducive to having having anything but myself and my partner to take care of (laughs) i i used to have cats um i had two cats uh i lost them in the divorce we'll say um and uh and after that i moved into a different place and was like you know i don't need that right now but i do want a corgi that's my goal in life to own a corgi Corgi. i want a corgi named sigourney weaver Mm. that's that's my plan that's yeah, that's, Sigourney that's, the corgi. that's cute I or th- sigourney the corgi i think the thing the thing for me is 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 that like i i really like like a lot of more medium large sized dogs and i just don't have the life that i like th- they're a lot more to take care of they need like they need a lot of exercise and they need a lot of time and attention and they eat a lot they they do and and so um yeah like my my like hashtag life goal is to have like a big beautiful dog and a upholstered leather wingback chair and a beautiful fireplace and that be my reading room and just have like yes like the the fine the fine scotch the smoking jacket i don't smoke but the smoking jacket before a fireplace reading a tome of lore uh, before the crackling fireplace, while the rain falls down outside, pipe. yeah, 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 pipe. yeah, right. And well, well, the well, the dog curls up by the by by the feet, and oh. and that 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 is to me that the that is my imagined happy place, right? Uh, I either that or or with friends or in front of my computer. <laughs> Uh, we yeah. are almost near the end of the hour. <laughs> Monty does sound like a cliche villain. I think there was a conversation uh, early in Monty and my friendship where we talked about superpowers. And Monty, like without hesitation, was just like, if I had superpowers, I'd become a supervillain. And I was like, what? no hesitation. And I was like, I'd be a hero. And he's like, then I guess we'd have to fight. And I was just like, oh my God, if Monty and I both got superpowers, we would become, it would be the classic tale. 
of Magneto and Xavier or whatever, but but it would be it would be that tragic story of Monty and I uh, not not agreeing on how to use our powers. Mm. I don't know if you still believe that. I still think that you would you would ultimately use your powers for good, but I maybe you might be the kill kill a million good. to save a billion type of person. I don't know. I, I I don't know. I I I think that like you know there the world does have enough villains. I mean that's true. I think that's I right. think so. I think that's the thing. You might yeah. You, you would use your power t- to to change the world in a way yeah. that would uh, exploit right. and destroy could I, could other. I, could I be the the villain to the villains? Yes. Yeah. You would do that. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. You'd be that. You'd be the um. What are, the oh man? I'm I'm drawing a blank on the name, but like the the sort of gray area hero. Anti-hero? Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you, anti hero. Yeah. That's it. I I was <laughs> yeah. drawing a weird blank there. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh yeah, what's that quote for like Dr. Horrible? It's like something along the lines of The like, world is a mess and I just need to rule yes, it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. how I feel. Right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I could see you being doc. No, you're you're smarter than Doctor Horrible, though. But <laughs> am I? I don't know, right? Uh, um, nice. Well, nice. now we're just into a full superhero discussion. In, in, indeed. Well, <laughs> I think this is the point where where we 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 sign off. Um, everyone, thank you so much for being part of this wild ride. Uh, we're gonna have a lot more hangouts like this over the course of the next couple of weeks as as this Kickstarter gets well underway and uh, taking all your questions, given lots of previews, showing off the new monsters, and I I just think that uh, I'm so so thrilled with how things have gone so far and so appreciative of all of you out there, our our backers, our audience, our patrons, our VIPs. All the amazing team at Ghostfire Gaming, all the amazing folks that uh, that contributed through Super Chats today. Thank you all so much. Uh, and there's we can't wait uh, to see what you do once you have all these wild monsters in your hands. If um, if you're on our our Discord channels or our Patreon, uh, our Patreon exclusive Discord, I'm going to be in there the whole campaign. Hyping it, talking about the stretch goals, uh, kind of showing things. So make sure to hop on our Discord if you want a few more sneak peeks. But get ready for a ton more updates on the Kickstarter because it looks like we are still moving along. Lots more stretch goals. Uh, People have been asking, do we have more than what's on the page? Uh, Yes, we do. And they will be revealed soon. Indeed. Well, with that, and thank you, Jill, for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you for having me on to chat all the uh, Kickstarter, the new book, and uh, just about hanging out and chatting D and D. Thank you so much. And also thank you to Joe. I know he's not here, but thanks to Joe and Kyle, who has mm-hmm. been hanging out in chat and does all of so much amazing work behind the scenes. Uh, if you saw the recent short, I believe Joe and Kyle threw that together. If you haven't seen the recent short. Go check it out. It's yeah. our best one that we've so ever good. done. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time in the dungeon.